All right, good evening, everyone. I'll ask you all to find a seat. Hopefully we have enough out. All right, thank you everyone. Good evening and thank you for joining us um, for tonight's community information meeting on homelessness. My name is Jamie Leggett. I'm the communications manager for the city of Chilliwack and it's my pleasure to facilitate tonight's meeting. Yay, Jamie! <laughs> Well, before we get started, I wanted to just get a few housekeeping items under, out of the way. Um, I know the folding chairs aren't the most comfy chairs to sit on, so if you need to take a break or stand up, please feel free to, to get up and stand against the wall or something if your back's given way. Um, and we have refreshments over in the corner. Be sure to help yourselves. Um, agendas were available at the front when you came in. Help us all keep on track. Um, and for the question period that's coming up, Zoya and Trish that welcomed you when you came in have pens and paper available. And you can either get up and go to the front to grab it or you can give them a little wave and they'll try to come over and help you out. Um, so why are we having this meeting tonight? At City Hall, we've been receiving a lot of emails, letters and phone calls about homelessness and we've been really busy answering all of them. And what we found is that many people have very similar questions about homelessness and not all of their questions are ones that really should be answered by the city. So we wanted to find a way to provide you with a lot of information from a number of different sources in order to give you a full picture of what's being done about homelessness in Chilliwack. So tonight our goal is to provide you with information about the roles and responsibilities of the various levels of government and to demonstrate what each level is doing to address homelessness within their mandate. So tonight we're going to hear presentations from the city, a uh, video from Mark Strahl, our MP, BC Housing, Fraser Health, the Chilliwack School District, and the RCMP. And since we have a large number of presentations, we are going to stick to a strict schedule. So I will be acting as the official timekeeper, and I have this red piece of paper, and I'm going to sit over there, and if you see me start waving this, it means you've reached the end of your time limit. Um, and we had asked you to write us with questions for tonight, and we actually received a number of questions. I have about three pages worth of questions that I've already received for our panel members. Um, and I did share a number of the questions with the panel members, so some of them are going to try to incorporate answers into their presentations as well. Now to start the, introducing, the evening, I would like to introduce you to tonight's panel. In the middle, we have Mayor Sharon Gates and Councillor Ken Popov. Yeah. Next, then we have Superintendent Deanne Burley. We have Mr. Dominic Flanagan, the Executive Director of Supportive Housing for BC with BC Housing. Mr. Stan Kuperis, Director, Mental Health and Substance Use with Fraser Health. And Mr. Alan Van Tassel, Director of Facilities and Transportation with Chilliwack School District 33. And we didn't want to overwhelm you with a super long panel, so we also have our VIPs in the front row here as well. I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Lori Thronis and Mr. John Martin, our members of Legislative Assembly. We have Chilliwack City Councilors, uh, Councillor Chuck Stam and Chris Clute in attendance Yee! somewhere. Stand up, boys. <laughs> uh, and I'd also like to have our Chilliwack School Board trustees stand. We have Paul McManus, Heather Moss, and Walt Cron. Walt, come on, stand up. <laughs> Bob Patterson. <laughs> we have uh, Miss Sylvia Dick with us, the board chair. 
and Evelyn Novak, the school board superintendent. And I'd also like to acknowledge the service providers that are here with us today. We have representatives from the Salvation Army, Ruth and Naomi's, Cyrus Center, and Habitat for Humanity. Thank you for joining us. Okay, and since we're on such a tight schedule, we're gonna jump straight into the presentations. I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Glenn McPherson. He's the Director of Operations for the City of Chilliwack. Hey, thanks, Jamie, and uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Glenn McPherson. As Jamie said, I'm the Director of Operations for the City of Chilliwack. I'd like to thank the public for coming out this evening and for the service providers at uh, the back of the room there. I'm going to start the evening by talking about homeless issues in Chilliwack and the work that has been done by the city, other levels of government, and local outreach and support agencies to deal with homelessness and related issues. If you have any questions during the presentation, because of time restraints, uh, please write it down. There's some answer uh, question slips at the desk by the door. Write the question down, hand it to one of the mediators or leave it at the front desk. And we'll try and answer all the questions uh, if we have time at the end of the pr uh, presentations. Okay. So let's start off with a look at the highest level of legislation that affects homelessness, and that's the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Charter is a fundamental piece of law that gives all the Canadians the right to shelter and personal safety and security. Unfortunately, as more often than not, the number of homeless in a community is greater than the available shelter beds or affordable housing options. Government must work towards finding solutions to reduce homelessness. It should also be noted that not all homeless choose to seek shelter, options, or support services. And this is also their right. No one can be forced into a shelter uh, or to accept support that's offered. The responsibility to provide affordable and supportive housing options. Sorry, the mouse is a little bit finicky here. There we go. There we go. So the, uh, the responsibility to provide affordable and supportive housing options lies with the provincial government. The province of BC does have, of course, many varied programs in place to help reduce homelessness and to improve the health and well-being of the homeless in British Columbia. Yeah, this mouse is really finicky. Okay, it's working again. Although housing is a provincial responsibility, municipal governments are affected by the Charter of Rights. And so much as that a, munici a municipality must allow the homeless access to public parks to set up temporary overnight shelters where there are no other shelter options available. In recent years, the bylaws of the City of Victoria and the City of Abbotsford were challenged in court and were found to be in violation of the Charter. The courts ordered both communities that they must allow temporary shelters overnight, but not during daylight hours, in their parks. Based on these rulings, the City of Chilliwack amended its own bylaws this past year to allow temporary shelters overnight in a number of its parks. The number of homeless in Chilliwack has been steadily growing, particularly over the last two years. And the map here shows the approximate locations of currently known homeless encampments. There are probably many others in the city that uh, we're not aware of. And these camps are both on public as well as on private properties. From July through October this year, an encampment was established in the downtown core at Empress Lane. Based on several factors, including city bylaws being infracted, public health concerns, violence between camp occupants and other groups, and heavy drug use in, public, in a public space, the city applied to the courts for an injunction to remove the camp. This was granted, 
and the camp was disbanded with the help of outreach workers and support agencies in October. Currently, there is an encampment under the Yale Road overpass on Railway Avenue. There are about 17 people occupying the camp who have all refused to move on when asked to do so. The city has therefore started legal action to remove this camp. The city has already been through the injunction application process and is now awaiting judgment through the courts. We're expecting an injunction and enforcement order within the next couple of weeks. At that time, the city will work with support agencies and shelter providers to disband the camp and to try to find a shelter for the occupants. One issue uh, that we've learned lessons from that has affected both the Empress Lane and the Railway Avenue camps is the actions of very well-meaning people who drop off food. The good intent to help the homeless is clearly obvious, but dropping off food does not deter camp occupants from seeking meals at, for example, the Salvation Army, where they can receive much more support than just a meal. If they don't go there, the outreach workers cannot offer additional supports. The slide shows a quote from Mr. Tim Bohr from the Salvation Army, who sums up this issue nicely, and he said, it is better to give a hand up rather than give a hand out. I mentioned earlier that the primary responsibility for dealing with homelessness lies with the higher levels of government, but of course the city and the local community must help if local solutions for Chilliwack are to be found. To this end, the city has developed the Homeless Action Plan to help steer the process and to find solutions for the homeless in Chilliwack. Here's the vision of the Homeless Action Plan. In simple terms, the vision of the plan is to bring organizations, both government and private, together so that with a collaborative approach, we can help the homeless to find housing. The plan was completed with six goals in mind. Firstly, the concept of housing first. This is to more quickly move homeless persons into independent and permanent housing and then follow up by providing additional support and services. The second one, we need to look at all types of housing, including shelter beds, supportive and transitional housing, affordable housing, low rent options. The third goal, solutions will only be found if all agencies work together. Goal four is about improving the health and safety of the homeless by ensuring support services are not only available but ensuring that the homeless know when and where they are available. Goal five, well, that's one of the reasons we're all here tonight. Goal six refers to employment, transitional housing, education for the homeless. The Homeless Action Plan will only achieve success because of the support from and involvement of the many other organizations who are contributing to finding solutions. The city has been asked on a few occasions, so what have you achieved with this action plan? We don't see a lot happening. The answer is we have achieved so far, so much. BC Housing have provided additional rent subsidies. Salvation Army, as of October, now have 30 additional overnight shelter beds with funding from the province. A recent announcement that $17 million is coming to Chilliwack for low rent units at both Ruth and Naomi's and Mamalot Quisum Toe Health Services. We have been asking Fraser Health to establish a detox facility in Chilliwack. Now a call for proposals for such a facility has been issued. The city is lobbying the federal government for housing partner strategy funds, and the city has supported submitted proposals from within our community. Council have set aside $25,000 to help with the expansion renovations at the Cyrus Center downtown. This will provide another four beds for Chilliwack youth. The Housing First concept I mentioned already, we have an active task team working on this. The city is looking at our bylaw to see if opportunities exist to allow more secondary suites. Council's development process and affordable housing advisory committee are looking at future development of affordable housing projects and Chilliwack Healthier Community Group is always look, is looking at ways to open up low rent units with fewer barriers for the homeless. 
The city is asking Fraser Health to establish an intensive care management team in Chilliwack. This is a multidisciplinary team that takes support out to the streets where the people need this acute support. Public awareness and education is important so people understand the challenges and people can find out how they can to help. We have a resource card, this one here, that many agencies in the community hand out to homeless persons. It lists all the shelters and the resources in town that the homeless can take advantage of. There's a pile here tonight, there's some at the front desk if anybody wants to pick one up. It's most important that the multi-agency outreach approach is continued through the Chilliwack Healthier Community Strategy. So the Chilliwack Healthier Community Initiative involves 42 strategic partners. Members meet regularly and the goals of the CHC mirror some of the goals of the Homeless Action Plan, particularly with respect to the goal of establishing a multi-organizational approach. These next slides will explain some of the direct actions and support that the city has already implemented to help tackle homelessness in our community. Any housing projects undertaken by non-profit agencies do not have to pay building permit fees, and the city provides ongoing tax exemptions for those facilities. City staff work with local outreach service agencies to connect them with local people, homeless people. The city contributed $500,000 capital and gave $63,000 in fee waivers to allow the Health Contact Center to be established in 2012. The city also provided a $311,000 DCC waiver and ongoing tax exemptions for the village project. The city has contributed to two projects at Ruth and Naomi's, totaling over $200,000. The city provided lockable storage containers at the Salvation Army Shelter so that shelter users can leave their belongings in a secure place. Cyrus Center is located in a rent-free city-owned building. The city has set aside $25,000 I mentioned earlier to fund the expansion of youth beds at the Cyrus Center. There's a real need for funding here as local youth in need are being turned away from this center. Just yesterday, however, we learned that the Cyrus Center has received funding for a short-term additional outreach worker for 19 weeks as a pilot project. Cyrus Center has applied for additional funding to hopefully make this position more permanent. The city advocated for more funding for additional shelter beds in the community at the YMCA. Provincial MLAs, Laurie Thronas and John Martin were approached and they were instrumental in securing the provincial funding that we needed in very short notice. The city receives a lot of correspondence from the community that really should go to higher levels of government for response. The city does redirect this correspondence and sometimes with added support from the city. This summer the city installed portable washrooms downtown. We now have washrooms at the Five Corners Green Space and at Salish Park. The washrooms include Sharps disposal containers which are being well used and we are seeing less needles in our parks. That said, the city still collects around 300 discarded needles every week from, the park, from city parks and city public spaces. The pictures on the slide on the screen show examples of discarded needles found over the past week. Used needles in parks are a huge concern for the city and, of course, for the community. The city is talking to Fraser Health to, to suggest that if they issued retractable needles, this would greatly reduce risk to the public when discarded. The city is also asking Fraser Health to provide more effective needle disposal or needle collection options in Chilliwack. This slide shows some of the operational costs that the city incurs in dealing with homelessness and drug use issues. We spend well over half a million dollars each year in dealing with these particular issues. So that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions about anything you have seen in this presentation, 
please write them down and hand them to a mediator at the desk over by the door. And if time allows, we will try and have them answered later this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McPherson. Um, now, our MP, Mr. Mark Straw, wasn't able to join us tonight, but he did send us a video presentation. Hi, I'm Mark Straw, your Member of Parliament for Chilliwack Hope. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you tonight, as the House of Commons is sitting in Ottawa this week. I'll be monitoring the discussion from afar, and I've asked one of my office staff to join you there tonight to report back to me directly on tonight's meeting. Each one of you are here because homelessness is a pressing and growing issue for Chilliwack. Our homeless population has grown exponentially over the past year. Tonight's meeting and others like it are crucial because local solutions require a multi-pronged approach to homelessness that involves the collaboration of federal, provincial and municipal governments if they are to be successful. Further, finding solution requires the cooperation and effort of Chilliwack residents so thank you for choosing to make a difference in our community and for attending this evening's homelessness information meeting. While social housing, mental health care and addictions treatment are all the responsibility of the provincial government, the federal government has provided some funding for municipalities to combat homelessness through the Homelessness Partnership Strategy. But the eligibility rules had previously prevented the City of Chilliwack from applying. When I learned of this restriction, I began working to have the federal government change the eligibility rules to allow Chilliwack and similar sized municipalities to apply for funding. As a result of these efforts and the efforts of many communities and individuals right across the country, the federal government has now changed the rules and has allowed organizations in cities like Chilliwack to apply for funding under the federal homelessness partnering strategy. I'm aware of two local community organizations who have already applied for this funding and understand that at least one has received funds. I will continue to work with local organizations to lend my support to their funding requests and to help them in their work towards their goal of addressing issues surrounding the homeless and those at risk of homelessness in Chilliwack. The federal government has recently concluded its consultations across the country on a national housing strategy. A portion of the consultations included the homelessness partnering strategy. Just this week, they released a report online at letstalkhousing.ca. My office is currently reviewing their findings and will be working with other levels of government to make sure we take full advantage of any new programs that come out of it. I've been in regular contact with the Federal Minister for Families, Children and Social Development regarding the homeless situation in Chilliwack and will continue to press him to ensure that Chilliwack gets its fair share of federal funding to address these issues. I do want to congratulate Ruth and Naomi's mission and the Mamalawa Kwisum Housing Society on receiving $17 million in combined funds from BC Housing and would like to thank MLA's John Martin and Lori Thronis for their determined efforts in this regard. This is a positive development for two organizations with a track record of delivering real results. When I hosted my public open house earlier this year regarding crime and homelessness, I was encouraged that over 125 people came out to learn more about how they could become a part of the solution. It's been heartening to hear stories of citizens who chose to get involved as volunteers with a number of local community organizations as a result of that meeting. What we heard there was that homelessness is much more than just a housing issue. It's a series of complex intertwined issues including mental health, addictions, restorative justice and the criminal justice system. To keep our community safe, we need a coordinated approach that will include increased law enforcement, addiction treatment, mental health services and affordable housing. I commit to continuing to work with other levels of government, organizations and citizens who are addressing the issues surrounding homelessness and once again thank the City of Chilliwack for their leadership and thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend. Right. We're doing very good. We're ahead of schedule. Hi, I'm... Oh, you probably don't want to watch that again. He's back. <laughs> there we go. Okay. 
Next, I would like to invite Mr. Dominic Flanagan, the Executive Director of Supportive Housing for BC. Thank you, and uh, very impressed by the uh, large crowd tonight, given the inclement weather outside. Um, I'm going to try and avoid the red card, so I'll um, keep my comments brief. Um, so, good evening. Um, I'm the Executive Director for Supportive Housing and Programs at BC Housing, and I have provincial responsibility for housing initiatives that address homelessness. I just realised I need to put my glasses on. Um, <laughs> Homelessness continues to be a significant challenge for communities across BC. We see this in a number of ways, whether through an increase in the number of people who are street homeless or the number of homeless camps, which have emerged over the last two years in particular and present a challenging trend for municipalities, including here in Chilliwack. And this pressure has come at a time when there is a scarcity of affordable rental housing in many areas of the province. It's also important to consider why people become homeless. In many situations, individuals end up in homeless camps because they struggle with substance use or mental health issues, making it difficult for them to maintain stable housing. We've also observed advocates in taking a lead role in establishing tent cities in order to highlight, such issue, uh, highlight issues such as the lack of affordable housing, as we saw in the Victoria Courthouse encampment this summer, or Aboriginal land right issues, as we saw in Oppenheimer Park in Vancouver. We also know that people camp outside for different reasons. They may encounter restrictive shelter policies or a lack of housing options after being discharged from hospital or exiting the correction system. And for some people, tent cities can provide a sense of autonomy and community that satisfies their needs. However, as we look to develop evidence-informed approaches to solving homelessness, we need to state clearly that tent cities should not be considered an option, especially for vulnerable people with chronic health issues. Sanctioning tent cities to exist as a permanent part of the housing continuum undermines our approach to housing and stabilizing vulnerable populations. However, despite these challenges, BC is seen by many as a leader in its approach to homelessness. We were one of the first jurisdictions in Canada to embrace housing first as a solution for stabilizing homeless people. Our programs to build supportive housing around the province, the funding of homeless outreach teams as we see here in Chilliwack with the Salvation Army with rent subsidies attached and the positioning of 24 seven shelters as a gateway into housing are all seen as innovative and strong examples of best practice. So I have a handful of uh, slides, which uh, I just want to share with you. So I, I think it's important that we look at the context for uh, um, how BC housing um, and that policy shift. So in, in 2005, the government induced a housing matters document. And what this document said is that housing programs that are, are being developed will target the most vulnerable. And the, the, the program was updated in 2014, and it was to break the cycle of homelessness. It was to make sure that any shelters or supportive housing being established had that integration of housing and supports. The next slide is a range of the programs that BC Housing has developed and enhanced in the last 10 or 12 years which target homelessness. So as you can see, we have our homeless outreach and shelters. They have a key frontline role in engaging with people who are homeless on the street and bringing them inside or through a, a rent subsidy and an outreach worker, connecting them straight away into housing. We've also developed um, supportive housing programs in terms of purpose built or through acquisition of, of properties and then turning them into supportive housing. And as I say, we've also um, developed uh, private um, rental subsidies, which are a gateway into housing as well. And I just thought this is a slide which shows how 
the investment made by BC Housing in the last 10 years. So this is in the, for the year 1516. We are currently spending $200 million a year across the, prov the province. To keep, put that into context, the, the operational budget at BC Housing is approximately $480, so it's been more than $480, $480 million. So that constitutes 40% of our operational budget is now targeted towards homelessness programs. And I think that's an important point because 10 years ago, BC Housing's primary role and mandate was providing affordable housing. But in the last 10 years, there's been a huge development in BC Housing around the development of programs that target homelessness. So 40% of our operational dollars now go to homelessness programs across the province of BC. Um, what happened in 2005 and 2006 when the um, Housing Matters document was published, that also coincided with the shelter program being transferred to BC Housing. Some who have long memories will remember the shelter program used to be administered by what is known now as the Ministry of Social Development and Innovation, so the Income Assistance Welfare Ministry. Um, at that time, uh, it, the shelter program was funded to the tune of $18 million for 800 spaces. We now um, provide approximately $75 million for over 1,900 spaces across the province of BC. That 75 million has gone into the doubling of the capacity, well, over doubling the capacity of the shelter program, but it's also um, gone into making over 95% of our shelters to be 24 seven staffed. And we are the only jurisdiction in Canada which has that kind of program. And what that means is that people don't have to line up in the evening and then kick, get kicked out the next day. So that 24 seven staffing of shelters has made a significant difference for many people across BC. The other thing that I would want to say is that in communities like Chilliwack, we have w one main shelter, the Salvation Army, providing um, a service. And in fact, that is, um, we have that in 25, as you can see, shelter communities. Um, and we have another community such as Langley, Maple Ridge, and many others across the province. So we've been working with the sector um, over the last 12 months to say that when you're a single shelter community, we want you to develop the minimal barrier model of being a shelter. And that is a bit jargony, but what we mean by that is that we wanna make sure that that shelter in that community can engage with the most vulnerable who are in the community and bring them inside and get them connected to support services, get them into housing and recovery and other community-based programs. So um, we're working with a number of nonprofits who are in this um, situation of providing shelter and the only shelter in town and making sure what that looks like. And also what it looks like, just to be clear, as well as the provision of harm reduction supplies, it also is about providing um, shelters which are welcome pets, create storage for people's belongings, etc. Because we, for example, we found the pet issue to be a huge um, barrier for people who are on the street. If they had the choice, many people would rather stay in the street, stay on the street, than give up their pet. And so we, we want our shelters and our housing, particularly those shelters which are minimal barrier, to be as um, accessible as they possibly as accessible as they possibly can be. So this is I just go through some of the other models you saw on that kind of continuum of programs. So as I said, in um, 2007, we started the homeless outreach program. And, and what this was, was this is a homeless outreach workers whose primary function was to engage with people who were street homeless and get them inside and we made rent subsidies available. And that program again made a significant difference. One of the challenges we've had now of course, um, where is the, we've had a massive and significant increase in rent in the last three or four years in particular and the rental stock and the rental vacancy rates in, in BC are very low. 
And I'm sure people um, in the room, or some people in the room, would have saw the CMHC study that came out this week, which showed a rental vacancy rate across the province of BC of approximately 1.6%. Um, and in some communities in the Metro Vancouver area and the Fraser Valley, it was even lower than that. So we recognize there are some challenges around that um, issue of providing rental subsidies for vulnerable populations. And I also just want to target um, and mention the Homelessness Prevention Programme, which is um, operated by the Aboriginal nonprofit here in, in Chilliwack. And what we recognise there, based on the success of our Homeless Outreach Programme, is that we made this a very targeted programme for specific target populations, such as women at risk of violence, leaving transition houses, people exiting the correction system, people leaving hospital, people of Aboriginal descent, and youth transitioning out of care. And, and this again has made, um, as we, this program has been operational for two years, and it's targeted in particular those, uh, those communities and those subpopulations who are homeless. And we've also, as part of that continuum, we continue to look about how we can develop supportive housing models. Um, and these are models that you have here in this community, whether it's the, uh, the contact center at the Anna's residence, whether it's the Ruth and Naomi um, building. It's about making sure that people are brought inside and have on-site supports and are able to connect with other community-based services. And we, again, continue to look and work with municipalities to see how we can develop other opportunities to develop more supportive housing. And I just wanted to talk about this um, tool um, at the moment. We've introduced this in the last 12 months. So this is what is called the Vulnerability Assessment Tool. And we've done some training here in this community on this tool as well, and other communities across the Fraser Valley and other communities in the Metro Vancouver region. And what we find this tool really helpful, you've heard some mention about housing first and about the need for a coordinated collaborative approach. And what this tool does, it's helped the agencies who are working with people who are homeless to talk a co about a common language. So what this tool does is measures a person's vulnerability who is homeless and it gives them a score and it allows people to be matched to between the um, housing with the right level of supports. But also it helps all the agencies in that community, as I say, to say when they're working with a, a, a homeless population in that community, to talk the common, same common language and use the same screening tool. We've, we've noticed this tool has been a huge source of information around the needs um, of the homeless population. It covers 10 domains, ranging from mental health, addictions, history of homelessness, life skills, um, etc. So um, if I'm happy to talk to people about the, at the end about that tool. If people have any questions, let me know. But we are starting to expand that tool across uh, BC. And this is just, um, I wanted just to kind of highlight some of the um, programs that we have developed here and enhanced in Chilliwack. So it's the shelter uh, with the Salvation Army. And of course, what we did this winter is that we recognized the significant rise in homelessness in this community. And we responded with the Army by creating an additional 30 spaces at the Army site. We've also enhanced their rent subsidy program as well. And we are working with the Army because we recognize we need to do more. And we're um, working with the Army to see what, how we can enhance the capacity at that site also for the spring. And we're working with the city on that issue as well. I also want to say is just that that's just the programs that I've listed there, which um, talk of the homeless population. We, in 1516, we spent approximately $7 million on some form of subsidized housing in the community of Chilliwack. That also will include, though, um, the RAP grants, so that's the re uh, rental subsidy program for low-income families, and also the SAFER program for low-income seniors. 
And that's approximately, by the way, the 7 million is approximately 1,000, about 1,400 units, that means of subsidized housing in, in this city. So in summary, as we know from working with vulnerable complex populations, shelters alone, as effective as they can be, are not the only solution to the problem. The provision of affordable housing provides a strong platform for partnerships and services to be delivered. Together, we can forge better and more coordinated partnerships across all levels of the government to find permanent solutions to both health and housing issues based on identified need. BC Housing is actively working with various ministries, in particular health, to create supportive housing options and improve systems for people with mental health and addiction challenges. This includes the needs to address gaps in the housing continuum by developing housing and shelter programs that target the chronic homeless population. Moreover, we are building capacity within our profit network to serve and work with complex populations. We continue to grow a system of access and assessment, such as the vulnerability assessment tool, so that people can be appropriately matched to health and housing options. So we recognize that homeless people are often some of the most marginalized and disenfranchised people in our communities, and that we need to work collaboratively in preventing homelessness and ensure we address the underlying issues that often contribute to street homelessness. So we need housing solutions which address the immediate need of people living on the street, as well as implementing strategies which address the underlying problems that drive people into homelessness. The issues associated with addressing homelessness are complex and more can be achieved when all levels of government and community partners work together. BC Housing is committed to working alongside the city of Chilliwack and our community partners represented in this room to create housing solutions for the most vulnerable in this community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flanagan. Next up, I would like to invite Mr. Stan Cooperis, Director of Mental Health and Substance Use with Fraser Health to speak. Good evening, it's uh, a pleasure here to be in Chilliwack. I live in Chilliwack, so I know this community uh, very well. I've lived here for many years. So my role is I am the Director of Mental Health Substance Use Services with Fraser Health, so I have responsibility for all acute and community mental health and substance use services in this end of the Fraser Valley. So I don't have a PowerPoint presentation for you, but what I do have is a full listing of all the mental health substance use services available within Chilliwack. And uh, when you came in, you had a sign-in sheet and you were invited to provide your email as well. So we will email out to you the full range of mental health substance use services within our community. But I will go over them briefly uh, now. So Fraser Health provides a range of mental health and substance use services that extend across the lifespan and care continuum, starting from prevention and health promotion to specialized intensive and inpatient care services. Uh, our services include inpatient and outpatient services, community and residential services that are organized in seven different service streams. So those service streams are as follows. So we have services for uh, child and youth and young adult mental health and substance use, uh, for adults ages 19 and above. Uh, we have community residential emergency short stay and treatment resources. Uh, we have what's called a Crest facility, which is a short stay residential facility in Abbotsford which Chilliwack residents have access to for short, short stay intensive support. We also have older adult mental health and substance use services and uh, a range of uh, just addiction services that are available. And then we have what's called tertiary level services. And tertiary level services are those services for clients with mental health and substance use with the most barriers that require um, intensive uh, residential support on a longer term basis. So we have also tertiary level beds here in Chilliwack. 
We also have a range of supported housing and residential uh, programs within the community of Chilliwack here. So I'm just going to break down some of those service streams a little bit further. So in terms of our acute care services, or services that are available in the hospital, we have an 18-bed uh, inpatient psychiatric unit. So it's 18 beds to serve this community. And in addition to that, we have what's called psychiatric nurses that provide uh, services within the emergency room for 16 hours uh, out of 24 hours. Uh, those uh, nurses provide assessment and intervention along with the psychiatrist uh, in the emergency room here in Chilliwack. Um, in addition, uh, in terms of the other um, facility that I mentioned, we have a, what's called the Cedar Ridge Tertiary Mental Health Facility. So it's a 20-bed facility here in Chilliwax it's called Cedar Ridge, and it's located at the hospital as well, and it provides the tertiary support for those kinds of clients that would previously reside at, uh, at Riverview. So we have 20 beds for here in Chilliwack. In terms of our community mental health services, we have a centralized intake process within our community mental health center, and uh, that service also provides other referrals and linkages to a range of other community supports and services. Um, we have what's called our adult short-term assessment and treatment team, and what this team uh, provides is short-term therapy, uh, particular for clients who have anxiety disorders or depression and do require short-term um, counseling. That team also provides a range of group therapy services. We have a range of groups for, for people um, afflicted with depression or anxiety disorders or personality disorders that really uh, do benefit from group therapy kinds of services. Uh, we do have an older adult community mental health program, so this team provides uh, both office-based and outreach services to older adults with, with mental health needs. And then we have our supported housing and community residential programs. So here in Chilliwack, we have a range of residential options for folks with uh, mental health issues. So we have Topaz Place, we have uh, First Avenue, we have uh, uh, a new facility that's just come, come into place on Vetter Road. So we have a range of community licensed residential beds as well. We also have a concurrent disorder uh, program. So our concurrent disorder program is an, is an outreach program. It provides uh, assertive outreach to clients with both a mental illness and a, um, an addiction issue. So it's, it's our concurrent disorder therapy program. We also have put into place um, a rapid access clinic. So we have the availability for local physicians to access a psychiatrist on a, on a very uh, short-term basis to get psychiatric assessments for their patients uh, to be seen by a psychiatrist quickly. And then that psychiatrist provides uh, recommendations um, back to the family physicians for implementation. So we have pretty quick access to psychiatry services here in terms of a psychiatrist here in Chilliwack. We have a number of other community uh, rehabilitation services that we offer. We have a peer support service. We have clubhouse programs, which provides some vocational rehabilitation and uh, vocational rehab services uh, for folks with serious mental illness here in Chilliwack. Uh, the other thing that we have, uh, we have a nurse practitioner service. So the nurse practitioner, along with various physicians, uh, see folks who are homeless, who either have mental health or substance use needs in the primary care clinic at the hospital, and also provides some outreach uh, to the street or to various service agencies around uh, delivering primary care services for, for folks with mental health and substance use needs. I'm just going to talk a little bit now about uh, services specific to substance use. Um, so in terms of detox services, we have what's called Creekside Withdrawal Management Services. So Creekside is, is a detox service. It's in Surrey. And what Creekside provides is uh, a detox service for clients with active addiction who require a medically managed um, place to detox. 
So that's in Surrey, it's a regional program, but certainly Chilliwack clients have access to Creekside and we do have staff that will, will bring clients to Creekside to access that service. What we also have, and unique to, to Chilliwack in the eastern end of the Fraser Valley, is what's called the Riverstone Home and Mobile Detox Program. So the Riverstone Program is a program that's co-funded through Fraser Health and the First Nations Health Authority. And what it provides is detox services on an outreach basis to clients with active addiction who are appropriate to receive detox services within a safe environment. It could be their home, or um, we have what's called star beds, so their short-term um, access to recovery beds where they, a person can be detoxed um, in a star bed and receive support through the Riverstone program. That program is strictly outreach. We also have a number of uh, residential treatment facilities available in terms of addiction treatment. We have Maple Ridge Treatment Center, the King Haven Treatment Center in Abbotsford, Pierdenville House, which is in Abbotsford, and a number of what we call stabilization and transitional living residences, or what's commonly known as stellar beds. And these are contracted uh, recovery facilities for both men and women. So that's some of the addiction services. We also have uh, a contracted agency, uh, Pacific Community Services, that we fund who provides the outpatient um, counseling services for people with, with addictions issues. More recently, what uh, Fraser Health has been able to do, and you've heard earlier in the presentations around the concept of an ICM team. So an ICM team, or an integrated case management team, is really uh, established to address folks uh, primarily with a substance use issue, uh, with or without a mental illness. And so we have the start of an ICM team, and we call it our Chilliwack Outreach Team. So what that team consists of currently is an outreach nurse, who's full-time, and then seven-day-a-week uh, healthcare worker support who works alongside that nurse and the Riverstone team in providing that outreach service to folks who are on the street with mental health and substance use needs. And that team seeks to link um, those clients with a range of services, whether at Salvation Army or at the hospital or detox or outpatient addiction services or residential treatment, but they are our, our outreach team uh, in terms of the beginnings of an ICM team here in Chilliwack. So there is a full range of, of services uh, within Fraser Health. Um, with, within, within Chilliwack, we have a strong history of collaborative working relationships with the city, with our various service partners, and so Fraser Health is uh, very committed to continue to advocate for additional resources, especially in terms of outreach resources uh, for mental health clients and substance use clients who are homeless quite, quite frequently. Um, so we have a, a history of strong engagement with all of our service partners and we'll continue to work collaboratively with, with all of them here in the community. And again, uh, we have a range of services. I will, if you sign up at the, at the door, we will send that out in terms of a uh, complete listing and how to access those full range of services that Fraser Health offers. Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys are all doing great, and it looked like my laptop fell asleep there. <laughs> all right, next up we have um, Mr. Alan Van Tassel with uh, School District 33. He's the Director of Facilities and Transportation. Great, thank you. So as Director of Facilities Transportation, what that means is myself and my staff are responsible for the maintenance of buildings, grounds, uh, and busing, in a, basically in a nutshell. So what I want to share with you tonight is the strategies we've used over the past year to ensure student safety and student and staff safety. Um, one of our most effective strategies has been an increase to our security patrols. Um, so we have increased that this year. 
to, to help some of the situations and issues that were going on. Um, the, the increased controls have also dramatically reduced things like graffiti on our buildings, uh, loitering, and other, other small pieces. So there's been more benefits to it. It's, it's worked out quite well for us. Um, we also use our security contractor to res respond to non-violent incidences. So if we have loitering on school grounds during operating times, um, we find that the uh, security comp company can respond quickly to those and help relieve that situation. Um, with, the, uh, with the security uh, contractor, we also work closely with the city and uh, we, we, we kind of have a mutual uh, agreement where we share the contractor so that concerns can be dealt with uh, either on city property or on school district property. Uh, we also use uh, daily reporting. So any incidences that are happen, we have written daily reporting going back to the city. This helps them log those events and see where the hotspots are and what's happening there. And we can you know, put joint forces together working, working at uh, alleviating those concerns. Um, at the school sites specifically, uh, we've increased our exterior checks, so doing, doing daily sweeps of the grounds, removing hazardous items such as broken glass, sharps, those things that we saw pictures of earlier. Uh, we have trained all of our staff that, that have to deal with these situations on the handling and storage of sharps. Uh, even in our grounds crew, when they're uh, doing mowing, uh, working in our gardens, those things, they're, we've done a lot of awareness training, so they're looking for these items and they have the training to deal with them if they're found. Um, our, our mowers have sharps containers on them, so as, as, if they're doing something, you know, as they're mowing and they find a situation, they can deal with it quickly and effectively. Uh, same in the gardening, as we're going through gardening and those things, we're keeping a close eye out for any hazards. Uh, to help discourage the loitering on our sites, uh, we've been working on improving areas that have poor visibility. So we have areas where there may, may be some trees, greenery, which doesn't allow a clear sight. So we've been trimming those back, removing those as necessary. We've also been looking at some of the large uh, structures or containers. We have storage containers on our site that may not be placed in a, in a best location. So we've actually been working on moving those into better areas to try and clear those visibility lines. We've done many upgrades to fencing, from repairing fencing, adding new fencing, looking at access to our property, and, uh, and correcting any, any shortfalls there. We've been working on bike storage. It's um, another thing where we've had concerns in the past, so existing bikes, student bike storage where we're improving the security of those, those facilities. Um, if in other areas we're actually adding containers where the bikes are stored during the day, and we also have situations where we're bringing uh, bikes into courtyards and they're locked secured in the courtyards, just to help eliminate um, someone coming onto the property thinking that this is something they can try and take away. Uh, we've also been working on signage you know, um, again, looking at the loitering piece and improving signage, identifying our properties, identifying when uh, it's not appropriate to be on the properties. We've been working with Crime Stoppers on this as well. So Crime Stoppers has been able to supply signage um, and also it has reporting numbers on there so public can easily see that there's a number there, can call in and help uh, clean up a situation. We've also been working on upgrades to our video surveillance. Many of our schools have video surveillance, interior and exterior. Uh, we've, we've moved to a commercial grade camera system. Offers us a lot better reliability, a better uh, photo image, and also larger storage. So we're maintaining several days of, of storage on these cameras. Um, we also, uh, Myself, uh, we, I sit on part of the Chilliwack Public Safety Advisory. Uh, so working directly with uh, the city, RCMP, fire department, 
the BIA, which is the Business uh, Improvement Association, ICBC, Crown Council, Restor Restorative Justice, and Stolo Justice. So there's some excellent contacts that are made at these meetings. We share a lot of ideas, we share our concerns, and uh, we're, you know, again, that joint force all working together uh, is working out really well. So mine is fairly short. Um, I just want an opportunity to share those, those pieces with you. But again, just really wanted to relay that the strategies we're implementing have made a big improvement, and I feel we're doing a, you know, a very good job at improving our student safety and, and staff safety in our, on our sites. Thank you. Thank you very much. And lastly, we have Superintendent Deanne Burley with the RCMP. Good evening, Your Worship, fellow panel members, ladies and gentlemen. Homelessness and policing is always a topic that gets quite controversial, so I'm going to try and explain where we stand from a policing perspective. See if I can work the mouse would be the first. <laughs> so we come from the perspective in the policing environment, in emergency response, that it is not illegal to be homeless. So I, I have no authority under any policing act to arrest someone or to detain them simply because they are homeless. As you see in the outline behind me, I'm, I'll discuss briefly what authorities I do have, how it falls under our mandate, a little bit about the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, vigilanteism, and what in fact are the police doing to assist the community and the homeless. So as I said, and I, and I repeat it often, and I repeat it at the office often as well, it is not illegal to be homeless. And the presentation opened uh, with Mr. McPherson earlier talking about the Canadian Charter of Rights. Because it is not illegal to be homeless, I have no authority to arrest, detain, or search someone simply because they are homeless. Everyone has the same rights and freedoms under our charter. If I choose as a police officer to arrest someone or detain them, I must have lawful grounds. And they are defined clearly for me in my training in the criminal code or other statutes that exist in our country. I have to believe that an offense has occurred or imminently will occur. If I'm dealing with an individual that appears to give me indications of mental illness, then I can come to a conclusion, or I can come in, I, I often come, I, my fellow workers, you've seen several members in here tonight, we come into contact with people who have signs of mental illness. I cannot arrest someone because they are suffering from a mental illness. The Mental Health Act gives me certain rights and privileges, I can apprehend them. I cannot arrest them, and there is truly a difference. And they have to be displaying behaviors that I either deem as a harm to themselves or to the public. So simply because someone has mental health issues, that does not make them um, detainable, apprehendable, or arrestable. And it's a point in law, and it is just something that I like to bring forward. So again, not illegal to be homeless. So what, what does the RCMP do? What is our mandate? Police forces in the province of British Columbia that are not RCMP are mandated by the Provincial Police Act. The RCMP is the national police forces mandated through the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Act. And as you see behind me, I've summarized the six primary areas that we're responsible for. What covers us tonight, what we're talking about tonight, is enforcing the law maintaining peace and order, and preventing and investigating crime. We are guided by laws, statutes, and case law. It was also mentioned earlier and alluded to earlier, the 2009 BC Supreme Court ruling in Victoria changed the environment 
as it relates to homelessness. Madam Justice Carol Ross found that prohibiting people from erecting shelters in the parks in Victoria was arbitrary and overboard, and hence not consistent with principles of fundamental justice. Big technical words saying that it's unconstitutional to restrict overnight sleeping in parks if homeless shelter beds are full. A few years later, in 2015, Abbotsford, a uh, second ruling came out of the situation in Abbotsford, R versus Chance, and it clarified an individual's charter right to shelter and added the requirement that not only shelter be available, but the options must be viable and accessible. So what does that mean for the police? It means I don't have the authority to walk in and remove somebody from a park simply because they've set up a shelter. I can't do it. If there is illegal activity, if there is criminal activity, if someone is being harmed, is a harm to themselves or others, then the police can intervene. The police do not have the legal right to remove homeless people who are encamped without an injunction or another myriad of, or other myriad of authorities which differ by location and are often individualized to the situation. So all of those big fancy words to say that although I as a police officer have discretion, I am bound by the law and every citizen homeless or with a home has the same rights. So the big question, what authorities do the police have? And here's where it gets a little bit technical. I've cited some, not all, authorities that we have when we intervene in situations that have caused great grief to the community because of what is perceived to be crime directly related to homelessness. And one of the things that I want to put forward before I get to any of this is not all theft in our community can be attributed to homelessness. As a matter of fact, we have current statistics showing that the problems with property crime, three quarters of those problems can be directly attributed to prolific offenders who have homes. So the reverse of that is, 25% of property crime is attributed to somebody who may not have a home. Cannot even with certainty say that 25% can be attributed to the homeless. 75% of property crime can be attributed to prolific offenders with homes. Are we working on those prolific offenders? Absolutely. We have a team dedicated to working on prolific offenders, to working on property crime offenders. So one of the sections that we can use in the criminal code, causing a disturbance, anyone who is not in a dwelling house who's causing a disturbance in or near a public place can be arrested by the police. And what is causing a disturbance? Again, it's independent to each situation. It can be screaming, shouting, and you can see behind me some of the uh, various definitions. Loitering in a public place is often discussed. To be criminal and to meet this, this section of the criminal code, it has to obstruct another individual. And that individual has to complain that they've been obstructed validly. Another section that we can use is trespass at night. That's on private property. So if someone is on your property at night there is no implied permission to be on private property at night. In the daytime, if you have a sidewalk and the mailman's coming up to your property to deliver the mail, that's implied permission. You've got a sidewalk, you're welcoming him to come to your home. At nighttime, it's, diff pardon me, it's different. Call the police. Intimidation. Big bunch of words in the criminal code, and I've copied them out on purpose because I can paraphrase, but it's always good to have the real words behind me. Anybody who intimidates another individual, and I'll just use the same word, such that they are restricting their access from doing something or from not doing something by blocking or obstructing a highway can be arrested. 
So in other words, if someone were to set up a tent, and I don't know why they would, on the middle of Vetter Road, they're obstructing a highway. If they set up a tent in a laneway, that meets the definition of a highway. A parking lot in a parking stall is a different story. So I bring that up, it's, it's by definition, and it gets very gray and we can go in circles all night discussing law. There's no lawyers in the crowd, right? <laughs> but there are sections of the code that we can use when we want to be able to deal with a situation that has gotten out of hand. Another one, of course, is section 430 of the criminal code, mischief. Um, somebody who destroys or damages property, obstructs or interferes with the lawful use or enjoyment of property, very similar to the sections already mentioned. And the police will, and I say that purposefully, we will investigate criminal activity as defined under any law or statute if we have credible information, evidence or suspicions. Arbitrary statements, beliefs, stereotypes are very difficult for us to deal with. To say all homeless camps are rampant with drugs, go in and arrest everyone for drug use, is an arbitrary umbrella statement that we cannot act on. Which brings me to the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, CDSA. Very simply, it is illegal in our country to possess, traffic, import, export, or produce a substance listed in the Act. I didn't list out all the substances. They're numerous. Heroin, cocaine, crack, fentanyl, I could go on forever. Marijuana is still illegal, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and something that people often say to us, well, there's a needle. That person just injected, they're in possession of drugs. I guess technically there is drugs in their body, so they're in possession of drugs. But evidence of past use, which is a used syringe, in our country does not meet the evidentiary threshold required by us to detain, arrest, or search an individual or their dwelling. And a tent, by definition, is a dwelling. I cannot enter your house simply because someone told me that you might have drugs in there. I cannot enter someone's tent simply because they told me they might have drugs in there. If I'm doing a patrol through the camp and I see it, or I see the syringe going into the arm, if I have credible inf information from an investigation, if I have a search warrant, I can, I can react. Drugs in plain view, as, as I said, can be seized and an investigation begins. We do not want drugs in our community. We do not want drug use by the vulnerable community, by vulnerable persons. And we will work to investigate information and evidence and suspicions that it exists. You can call the detachment directly. You can speak to a police officer that you see, or if you don't want your name put forward, there's Crime Stoppers. And also, just before I flip or move on, it was mentioned earlier um, by City Operations how many hypodermic needles they pick up weekly. They were very kind and provided me with a phone number. Sorry. <laughs> I believe it, probably can't read it behind me. 793-2810. If you do see sharps in the parks, in public areas, please call they will be picked up. We do not want them in our public areas. Another issue that comes up and has come up with respect to vigilantes or with respect to homelessness in our community is vigilantism. I've put a definition there, a colloquial definition. We do not condone or recommend vigilantism. Individuals who engage in this kind of activity risk their personal safety, the safety of others, and they risk criminal prosecution. If you witness a crime, if you are frustrated, if you've witnessed several crimes, please continue to work within the law. Call us. We cannot always be there within minutes of the call. We do prioritize call response, but if it is a crime against a person, if there is something going on right then and there, 
please articulate exactly what's going on, the time frame that it's going on in, and a response will be made accordingly. And of course, 911 if the act is in progress. So how are we responding? Oh, that didn't work. How are we responding to hopeless, homelessness? What is the RCMP doing? We start by the premise that homelessness is not illegal. I know, I sound like a broken record. Our mandate is to enforce the law, but we do have discretion. If there is a mental health issue or an addiction issue, we work with everybody on the panel, we work with all of the organizations present here tonight. Without their support, we could not do our job. We do curfew checks. Individuals out on parole or bail often have curfew checks, or have curfews. So we do curfew checks regularly. Are they home at the hours they're supposed to be home? We do street checks. If somebody's driving down or riding down your street or your back alley on a bicycle at night with break-in tools, we're going to stop and talk to them. We can't arbitrarily stop someone because some of us actually use bicycles to go to and from work. But we have articulable grounds for which we can stop someone. For instance, if you don't have your helmet on, you actually are breaking the law, so we can stop you. If you have a hammer hanging out of your backpack, pretty good grounds for us to stop you. So we do that. We do safety treks. We do patrols. We do foot patrols, bike patrols, vehicle patrols. We walk through the homeless camps. We walk through the downtown core. We walk through your neighborhoods. The safety of the public is paramount. And we're responsible for everyone's safety. Everyone in this room, everyone in a homeless camp. If we are able to show that an individual in a homeless camp is using a generator stolen from a residence down the street, we will do the investigation. And if we reach the evidentiary th threshold necessary, we will charge them. If a person living in a homeless camp has been kicked and beaten, we will do the investigation and charge the individual who kicked and beat them. I did speak earlier about property crime, about our prolific offenders. We have what we call hot spots in the city. We target the hot spots. We list our prolific offenders. Our members know who they are. We visit them regularly and we investigate them on a continuous basis. We work in partnership, as I stated earlier, with everyone in this room. Without them, we can't do our job. Yes, we pretty much are the uh, heavy-handed end of law enforcement. That's our mandate. But there's many other ways to deal with the problem. And homelessness isn't an issue, has been stated many times over tonight, that one agency or one individual can solve. Everybody in this room has a part to play. When, and, and just of note is when we do do the walkthroughs through the homeless camps, we are looking for items that uh, may be have obtained by crime. We're looking for any prohibited weapons, any persons wanted on outstanding warrants, anyone outside of a curfew check, and anything that may constitute crime. At times, we have uh, arrested individuals but at times we've arrested individuals downtown Chilliwack or on the south side as well. Everyone here has a part to play and I would ask that everyone take responsibility for their property and for their homes. We're, we live in a growing community. We live in an amazing city. I've been here almost four years now. We all have families here, we all care about what goes on here, and we all care about individuals who are not as fortunate as us. So please ensure that your homes are locked, your outbuildings are locked, your vehicles are locked. Don't leave your garage door opener in your vehicle while it's unlocked with a $20 bill on the seat. Yeah, they laugh, it happens every day. 
33% of theft from vehicles is because the vehicle was unlocked and it was a crime of opportunity. I have to throw that in everywhere I go. Use motion lights around your property. Nobody wants to be seen. Put the motion light on, the light comes on, they'll scatter. So those are just a few little tips. I thank you for your attendance tonight and for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Superintendent Burley. All right, before we move into the, the question portion, um, I'd like to ask Mayor Gates if she'd like to make a few comments. Thank you, Ms. Leggett, and uh, good evening, everybody. I am so glad you're all out here tonight. It's so um, inspiring to see a community come together for a community issue. And I really want to say to each and every one of you, I know there are other things you could be doing tonight, but thank you. Thank you very much. If at any time you want to help yourself to coffee and goodies, they are over on the side. Uh, you know, I guess as I've been listening to all of this, we've heard a lot about the services that are available in our community. And you can hear that there are a lot of services that are available to people. There's some, of course, that we have some gaps in. But I think the main thing you can see here tonight is there are a lot of people who care. There are a lot of people in this room who are saying, no one should live without a home. No one should be unsheltered. No one should be sleeping rough. No one should not have health care. This seems to be a basic human right that all of us would say should happen. But we would be um, naive if we didn't think that there are people who are fed up in this room. People who say, I'm so tired of going around that homeless camp. I'm so tired of needles. I'm so tired of seeing feces and condoms. I'm tired of this. Who's doing something about it for goodness sakes? And sometimes I think we all fall in the middle. The times when we can't go to sleep, quite go to sleep at night because we're thinking about the people who are out there in the rain and the cold, covered by a tarp or some cardboard. We're thinking about how they got there, thinking about maybe when they were younger they were abused, maybe they had drug issues and still do, maybe they had a mental illness, maybe there's no safe place for them. And we go to bed with that in our hearts and in our minds, and it's hard for some of the people in this room to actually sleep knowing that there are people in our community who fall into those categories. I recently had the opportunity to sit in on a meeting where people are starting a new service for women who are exiting the sex trade. And the story that was told would bring anyone to tears. And we all think about, I'm a spoiled rich kid, really. I, you know, all of us, every single one of us are sitting in this room, as far as I can see, have coats and shoes and boots. We've all been fed well. We're rich. We're rich. And there are others who do not have that. So I hope tonight we come together in a spirit of humility, knowing that but for the grace of God, some of us would be there. If we were in the right situation, or we're abandoned by a parent, or we're sexually abused, or we have a mental illness, we might be one of the ones under cardboard tonight. So the spirit of humility and smugness and judgmentalness, I hope that that part by the end of this evening, you can let go of the part that, that, that says no one, no one should do this and I wish they would just stop and the police would arrest them. I hope that all of you will think, how can I be part of a solution? I want to say that this is the most perplexing, perplexing issue that has faced our council. Councillor Chuck Stam is the chair of the, it was called the Development Process and, and Housing Committee. It's now being changed to Affordable Housing and Development Committee. Uh, Councillor Chris Clute here tonight too. Every single member of our council thinks about this nonstop. We do it as well because you heard uh, Mr. McPherson earlier talk about how much of our time is spent with this 30% of our operational time. Uh, 
spent with cleaning up, hosing down walls, picking up, picking up garbage, making sure there's no needles around, uh, trying to look out for people and get to know them. Because you know what? I think that we have somehow dehumanized homelessness. We've dehumanized it. We call it homelessness. They're homeless people, people, human beings. And the reason I think that some people don't care is because they don't know a homeless person. They've never bumped into one. That's why I want to say, first of all, a huge shout out to all of the agencies that are here tonight. They know the homeless by name. They know their story. They've heard their story. They've walked with them. They've cried with them. They've tried to get them the help that they need. And I think you should put your hands together to thank them, first of all. They move people into community. And community is where we all start. If somebody knows us, somebody cares about us, somebody feeds us, we start to form trust and bonds and community. And these are where these groups begin. I remember in about 2005 on council, we started to hear a little bit about homelessness. And the mayor of the day, Clint Ames, brought in a man called Philip Mangano, who was hired by the George Bush establishment to try to end homelessness in the United States. And he made some amazing strides in San Francisco and in Portland in particular in reducing homelessness by providing homes. He demonstrated to all of us that housing or health care costs plummet when people have a house. Their feet don't rot off. If you talk to people who are homeless tonight, they will tell you one of the biggest issues that they face is their feet. They're wet all the time. They talk about their backs from sleeping on the ground. They hurt. And health care goes down when you give them a home to sleep in where they have a toilet like we all have and warm food. I want to really thank everybody because you've walked into this perplexing issue with us. And I hope not one of you comes, came here tonight with a pointing finger because you'll hear from Fraser Health, you'll hear from Housing BC, you've heard from them, you've heard from uh, the superintendent in policing, you've heard from our MP, you've heard from our school district that everyone is running so fast trying to deal with this issue. So I hope you come to be part of a solution that you come to care, and I just really want to ask you in the spirit of Christmas, that when you go by these agencies tonight, slip them some money, give them support. They give you a tax receipt that you can get money back from the government for that. And I really want you to talk to them about what they do and how they provide services in our community. Who knows, maybe you'll end up being a volunteer, and who knows, maybe you'll be the one who is able to say, this year, we ended homelessness in Chilliwack, and I was part of that solution. So thank you all for that. We're going to go into the questions, which are very complex, too. So thank you to all of those of you who took the time to write out your questions. And I think uh, Ms. Leggett is going to come, and she's going to direct them to different people at the table. If something is, um, has come up in the discussion and you thought, oh, I'd like to ask a question about that, please go over and get a piece of paper, and we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Thank you for allowing me to get on a soapbox for just a moment, because I, I know that all of you have that same compassion, and I'm just hoping that we can pull even more out of you tonight. Thanks so much. All right, thank you, Mayor Gates. We have a lot of questions here, and I almost don't know where to start. <laughs> Um, I think the first one here we're going to start with is for one of our service providers. So I'll have Zoya grab a mic. Um, I think Tim Bohr might be the one for this one. It's about your quote when you talk about handouts. It says, when you say not to give handouts to homeless, are you saying that all necessary resources are in place to serve all the needs of the homeless without additional support from community members? 
It's a very good question because it, it really goes to, I think, the heart of the difference between a short-term fix and a long-term solution. So the question is asking, does that mean that all of the supports are in place right now? No, they're not in place right now. And that's what we're working towards. And you heard um, the panel members, levels of government saying, we're working towards those solutions. We don't have everything we want in place right now. Rental availability isn't what it needs to be. We need additional support services. The Deke Talks is in Surrey. It's not very close to Chilliwack. And there's a wait, you know. So, no, the supports aren't all in place. But the handout is counterproductive. At, at the end of the day, we want to give more than that, you know, that cup of coffee. We want to say, come in from the cold, come into the supportive uh, communities that our community offers where there can be opportunity for real, long-term, sustainable change. And I get it. I understand that heart of compassion wants to do something. And, uh, you know, I, we heard reports of people providing tents, and I know that's very well-intentioned. But in the long term, it doesn't help that person make real change. And so it's trying to determine what is the most productive, motivating, and helpful thing that I can do. And it's really to help that person get the supports that they need. Predominantly, and for those of us who are service providers, we know, and the mayor alluded to this, it happens when there's a relationship of trust. So if that cup of coffee is just a cup of coffee, it's not gonna help. If that cup of coffee is the beginning of building a relationship where you can then encourage that person to get help or to come with you for help, those are two very different things. So my outreach worker, Scott, is here tonight and he's at the back table. He would go down, quick story, and then I'll move on because we have lots of questions. Uh, he would go down to the homeless camp at Empress Lane and they would say to him, where's our coffee? We don't want to talk to you. Because everyone else was bringing coffee. And they were missing out on the person who has a rent subsidy from BC Housing to get them into long-term permanent housing. And that's the difference. So I hope that helps to clarify. That's good. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. The next question I have here is for Fraser Health. Um, and this individual is wanting to know what is the waiting time for a homeless person with an addiction, uh, active drug addiction to get into a regional detox center like the one in Surrey you mentioned? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so right now we have our, as I mentioned, our Creekside Withdrawal Management Unit, that's in Surrey. So there's a number of weeks wait to get into that. In addition to that, though, what we do have is our Riverstone Home and Mode Mobile Detox Program. And they do have access to detox beds a little closer to home. Um, but you have to understand, and one thing I think it's important to clarify, is that all substance use services are voluntary. So even though our team, all of us might think that somebody needs addictions treatment, they need to be detoxed. That is a voluntary service. So part of what we need to do is, is, as Tim mentioned, we need to have engaging relationships. We need to engage individuals, develop relationships with them, and move them towards treatment. So do we have enough detox resources? No. But more importantly, we need more outreach workers to engage with folks on the street to uh, develop those relationships and move them towards treatment because all substance use treatment services are voluntary. We have no way of compelling anyone into substance use treatment. That's an important distinction to be made. Um, so yes, we need more detox services. Not only detox services, we need more uh, residential treatment beds. So what is coming on stream is you may have heard in the province uh, an initiative called 500 Spaces. 
So the province has provided funding for 500 treatment beds. Uh, Fraser Health's portion of those treatment beds is 147 beds. And all those 147 addiction treatment beds are to be opened by uh, March 31st. So Fraser Health is a very long ways along in that proce process in opening further treatment beds. Uh, we have a number of additional treatment beds to go, uh, some of which are treatment beds for um, our Aboriginal population. Uh, South Asian men, in particular, uh, require uh, addiction treatment. And also uh, youth ages 13 to 19, there's beds coming on stream as well in terms of addiction treatment for youth. So those are all coming on, on stream. So it's not just about detox, it's about access to a range of substance use services, not only detox. Thank you. As a follow-up question, um, are there plans in place or what plans are in place to prevent people that are accessing these services, the, the detox services, from becoming homeless? So with our, our, our range of uh, addiction services in terms of outpatient treatment, residential treatment, detox and so on, we do, we do uh, work with individuals uh, who have gone through treatment to, to gain stable housing, whether that's a supportive recovery kinds of housing or other supports and services. Um, but there's effective discharge planning post-treatment to uh, assist a, an individual to maintain their recovery and move into more stable housing. And we heard about the housing first approach. And that whole housing first approach is, it's hard to deal with your mental health or addictions issue if you don't have stable housing. So the very first thing we need to do is ensure that folks have stable housing and then they're more able to deal with their mental illness and addictions issue. But there is effective uh, discharge planning at the end of treatment, but we also know that with addictions treatment, uh, relapse is also part of the journey. So often folks go through detox or residential treatment and may re relapse and end up back on the street. Um, so sometimes it takes a number of attempts, uh, a range of services um, to really get somebody to a point where they're, they're truly stable in, in their um, addiction recovery. Thank you. Uh, the next question I'll direct to Councillor Popov and Superintendent Burley. This question is, I live near the homeless camp by Bernard Elementary School. Our things are getting stolen regularly and the camp isn't safe. What are you doing to stop this and why are homeless camps becoming such an epidemic? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Popoff. As I mentioned uh, when I was speaking earlier, we are walking through the camp on a regular basis. We go in with our partners. The outreach workers are going in there as well. We are working on a call response basis also in the neighborhood. So if there is a theft or property has gone missing or there's a mischief, we need to know about it in order to react. It is a fallacy that the police know everything. We don't. So please report any crimes. We will investigate and we will go into the camps and we do sweep the, uh, I use the term sweep. We do patrols through the camps to look for stolen property. So if someone has said they've had a bicycle or a generator or those types of items stolen in the general area, we'll go and walk through and see if it's there. But there's no automatic nexus to the homeless camp because someone's had property stolen. Mm -hmm. If the camp itself is unsafe, if there's, if there's items in the camp that are not uh, conducive to a safe lifestyle, if there's propane tanks, open fires, we do work with our partners to ensure that those are removed. Is it an epidemic? I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that question. It is an issue in our community and that's why we're talking about it tonight. I'm hoping that answers the bulk of it from a policing perspective. Again, it's not illegal to be homeless and simply because something's stolen from the neighborhood, I cannot make the conclusion that it was a homeless individual living in the camp under the overpass. I do an investigation, my members do an investigation, and we see where it leads us. Thank you, Deanne. And I can maybe add to that, um, I do have a business in a close, close proximity of that overpass encampment, and, and I do experience uh, a lot of these folks uh, in and around uh, um, Alexander and Lois Lane area with their with their carts and their and their bikes and backpacks and that sort of thing and 
and I do get visits um, quite often from from citizens that are concerned, and, and absolutely it is a public safety issue, and that's what it's turned, and a health issue. Where are these folks going to the washroom? You can well guess where they're going to the washroom. Um, I know Gerard's in the room here, and I do visit him on a ongoing basis, and, and I I feel for him. It's it's not fair to have a business in that area and have, have to put up with that. Um, we are doing what a city can do, or as as Glenn Glenn McPherson alluded to earlier on in, in his presentation, we are using the steps that we can use. It, it's just called an injunction. It's 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 time. It's arduous. It it is going to happen. They will move along. Um, I heard a um, I'm not going to say it's a funny story, but an interesting story. But uh, there were three there were three cots that were stolen from the Salvation Army were recovered from underneath there. Kind of ironic, just, uh, you know, these folks are stealing from people who want to help them. And, um, and I know, I've seen Brian from Griffin Security there, I, I, I get the reports, and there was, uh, there was a lady that was, uh, was badly injured there a couple of days ago, so it's not safe. And I know across from me, um, I'm on Alexander Avenue, there's, there's a bit of a park there, the emergency response folks came in there and there was a lady that, that OD'd. Um, the ambulance came quick, but left very slowly. So um, I'm not assuming that she didn't live, but uh, chances are she, that she didn't. I talked to some of the folks there and, and he said, well, you're, you're born an addict, you're gonna be an addict. Well, yeah, but there are other, other ways, there are other means. You know, with Tim at Salvation Army, uh, um, you know, like you know, the folks at R Ruth and Naomi's, it's, um, yeah, it's a tough thing. I got to know a few of these folks and, and you know, followed them from downtown to underneath there as well. And, and um, some of these guys, you may be able to help with some more detox type facilities, which we are advocating for in the worst way because that is just, inadequate to have a six week or a three week wait. If these folks want to get help, they want help now. And and that's something that we're working on. So um, I can go on and on, but I know in interest of time, I'll... I do want to jump in on this one too, because I think it's really important for people to know that when a camp does become entrenched and it is on city property, not private property, we don't have any right on private property, but on city property, we do seek an injunction. And we do ask that it be moved. Now, some people have said, well, isn't that counterintuitive because they'll just go somewhere else. But our experience has been that some of them leave. Some of them seek shelter. Uh, a car, when we disband the one that was out on um, behind Empress Lane, there were cars that came to pick up some of these people. We have no idea where they went to. And uh, we don't believe that any homeless camps are safe. We don't believe they're safe. They're certainly not sanitary. And when people say, well, you put washrooms in, they become entrenched. If you start putting in services there, they will not go to Ruth and Naomi, Salvation Army, Cyrus Center. They will stay in the camp. So we're determined it's costing money to be able to have an injunction on every one of these camps. We know we have enough shelter for them. For the ones who are in that camp right now, we have empty beds right now at Salvation Army. We're receiving more beds and more housing. We have services for them. So we will keep seeking injunction. They also said, and I need to tell you because um, one of the businesses that is here had feces spread all over their door by somebody who was angry at them for whatever reason. McDonald's, we had to chop down the trees with their permission and their help because people were um, defecating under the trees and doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. They had to take out their play equipment, install um, lighting for needles. All of those kind of things are part of this, so it impacts businesses. Um, we are talking uh, to the businesses in the surrounding area and please asking them for patience. No one has forgotten about them. We're working very hard to try to get these um, issues before the courts. Thank you. I think um, this leads into uh, the next question I have here for our service providers again. Uh, I guess Tim and, and Bill are sitting close together, so you might be able to answer this for us. Um, 
Someone wrote in and asked us if it's true that many of the homeless refuse to accept overnight accommodation when it becomes available. And the second part of their question is they're wondering where most of the homeless people are from, if they're from Chilliwack or if they're from out of the area. So the answer to the first question is yes. Uh, the second question is they're from what we're finding and experiencing. I, I, I'm executive director, so I stand behind and I have a staff. And uh, so I always say I'm going to go downstairs because we have a drop-in center and I'm going to start talking to some of the homeless people and see where they come from because you hear a lot of stuff floating around the community. So here's what I've determined from the folks I talk to and what my staff have said. Okay, is that a lot of the homeless people are coming right now from northern British Columbia and Alberta. That's okay, but they're coming VIA, the lower mainland. So they go into Surrey first or into Port Coquitlam or Maple Ridge, and then from there they come up the valley to where we are. And uh, it's, it's an ongoing problem, and, and it is what it is. So if I can just address also the vacancy. So that the, you saw BC Housing said there's 11 shelter beds and they added another 30. The additional 30 beds are in our soup kitchen. We clear the tables and chairs every night. We set up cots, <clears throat> some of which were stolen, um, some which we have now recovered as well. And so the vacancy that we have is in the 30 beds. We're averaging about 20-ish. We had 25 last night. So there are some spare uh, spaces in that 30-bed temporary. The, the existing shelter, which is the permanent structure, which has the 11 beds, we have an additional five uh, or for extreme weather or overflow. That is running at capacity every single night. So there's no vacancy in the permanent structure. The temporary structure is, is in the soup kitchen has the vacancy. Thank you. The next question is for the city, Mayor Gates. Has the six-story Ruth and Naomi's apartment building um, that we're hearing about, has it been zoned? This is not appropriate for a residential neighborhood. So it is a residence, just to make everyone aware of that. It will be residential in nature. But as with every application that comes in front of the city, you have to go through a rezoning process. That rezoning process, everybody is permitted to come out and speak to council about the proposal to see whether it is appropriate for the neighborhood, whether it is necessary. Uh, and uh, so the people that need the shelter, I am sure will be there when there is a when there is an application in front of council, and I'm sure the neighborhood will be as well, because I think, in honesty, what I've learned on council, I'm sure all my councillors would join with me in saying that most neighborhoods don't really care for change in their neighborhood. They kind of like it on the periphery, and they agree with change that happens in someone else's neighborhood. So we have a challenge in wa walking through the issues that may be issues. The one thing that has really been positive, well, there's many things, I'm sorry, not the one thing that has been positive. The, one of the positive things that has happened with Ruth and Naomi is when we first rezoned it, they uh, signed, they agreed to put together a good neighbor agreement that talked about noise, that talked about littering, that talked about how they, people should react in that neighborhood. And we haven't had a lot of complaints, but we will find out at the public hearing. And I'm sure that because they have the funding, and thank you to the province for providing funding and announcing funding for that project, uh, because the funding is there, I'm sure that they will have an opportunity if that piece of property was for one reason or another not rezoned to find a place. We all are. We all are mandated by law to go into a public hearing in a quasi-judicial way. We have to keep an open mind. None of us can go in with our mind made up. We're not permitted to by law. So we will listen to all sides of the story. And, uh, but I do hope that it's sometime, in some place, Ruth and Naomi's will be very successful. Thank you. If I can just jump into that. Actually, Bill can, can, can maybe answer or, or can tag on to me too. It is going to be, it is family orientated, so uh, single father, single mother, uh, uh, single family, one, two, and three bedroom, but please Bill if you want to yep. fill in the blanks. So the first thing I want to say on that is uh, I, we've been proactive in the community and we're having information sessions. I'm having three. I've had my first one 
And, uh, and I just want to give you a, a, a bit of an idea. So we had one problem neighbor when we first built the place that was concerned about it because of who we, who we deal with and who we attract. And uh, so I was worried this neighbor showed up at the meeting and uh, we were getting some kickback from the neighborhood and understandably so because like the mayor said, that people have a hard time with change, except me. Uh, so I said, uh, so in the, uh, when we were talking, this gentleman put up his hand and he says, I want everybody to know on my street. He said that I've lived in this community for 12 years and the best five has been since Ruth and Naomi's been here. And a lot of it is because of the good neighbor agreement uh, we had, like, we have a recovery house, and uh, we had one case where a guy was acting up, it caused problems with his neighbor, we made him go over, apologize, and then he cut his grass twice, and so the neighbor's been happier ever since. So, so we try to work with that, and um, so we're building this thing uh, for families, it's a family center. Um, this is the time of year that the mayor mentioned again about it's Christmas, it's a time to give. I always say that Jesus was the first person who was homeless because his mom and dad went door to door, Mary and Joseph, trying to find a place. They went to the Holiday Inn, Bethlehem Inn, and said, have you got room? And they said, no, we don't, but we'll put you over in the stable down the street. This year, five times I had to tell families there was no room at the inn. And it's a hard thing to say because then they say, well, I have a six-month-old baby and I've been, we've been evicted because of rent evictions. So uh, it's, it's a touching topic, but we did it for families because there's lots of single families out there and they need our help. So we have one, two, three bedrooms and studios for parents who have uh, rights for kids on the weekends. They have a place they can now go. So we're looking to try to make the community better. We're having a teaching kitchen so the parents can come down and learn how to cook and cook efficiency. efficiently. We have a, a chef on staff that actually came out of Banff Springs. And, uh, and he cooks uh, f for us and he get, get, provides great meals. So he's going to teach these folks how to cook efficiently. So we're all excited about it. We're going to have a daycare for them. So if they want to go to work, they have a place to bring their kids. So they were, we're looking at that conceptually. There's a lot of details to it. And we got a year and a half. Thank God that we can work out that. Thank you. Right. I received two uh, similar questions here, so I'm going to try to morph them into one. Um, the question is, could we pay or find a way to uh, give gift cards, money, cash to homeless people to correct, collect trash? Um, they could dedicate a few hours and it would serve as an incentive. Um, Mayor Gates? So does, I, I'm sorry, it's a question, say, can, can, can I give somebody a <laughs> gift card or can you give someone a gift card? Could and the city hire homeless people to okay. collect, collect trash? Why don't we go with that? Yeah, we do get asked that a lot. And I, I, if I, some of you are old enough to remember uh, Bill Vanderzam. And <laughs> I remember he used to talk about that. I think he got booted out of, uh, out of office when he had a little shovel that he had on his, his lapel. Um, you know, what is really difficult with this is I think we all have a fundamental understanding of the way that we get food is we earn our way, right? That's what we do. We all go to work, we work hard, and we can eat, and we have a place to sleep, and uh, we, don't like, we don't like it when people have a sense of entitlement. That's quite basically what the issue is. But as far as paying people to pick up trash from the city's perspective, um, there are a few issues around that. The first one is workers' compensation. Can you believe that? But that is a huge issue for cities and the liability around workers' compensation. And here, for all those of you who love your union job, it's also against the union. <laughs> so uh, our city workers do pick up the trash. But I am sure, I do remember we have one guy, um, Les, in our community who is homeless. And he would go out and he would sweep. I saw him sweeping the sidewalks and individuals would go up and give him Tim Hortons cards or whatever and thank him for doing that. So, yeah, I, we can't mandate that. But whoever asked about that, um, yeah, I get the feeling behind it and appreciate the sentiment. Yeah. And if I can chime in there, a, um, a local contractor that I know personally, he, um, he has empathy in a heart and, and, and he had... Uh, actually stopped underneath the overpass at one point and offered, there was a house to be moved and it was a real tight time frame and he was gonna pay 
somebody or he needed three or four guys, 50 bucks for a couple hours to come out and help him work. They, they chose not to. Thank you. All right, we're getting close to the end of the evening. I'll try to squeeze in maybe a couple more questions. Um, one for BC Housing. I received a couple for BC Housing. Um, one lady wrote in and said that she is very lucky to have a roof over her head, but she doesn't feel safe in the, the affordable housing that she's found. And she's wondering what's being done to ensure that people can find safe, affordable housing. Um, well, I mean, so I, I think obviously in, in all our homes, we want to feel safe um, in any homes. And uh, um, so this person is living in affordable housing and, and doesn't feel safe. Yes. Um, I'm trying to catch the eye of the uh, the police. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I think in the, in the housing that we develop, whether it's supportive housing, in particular, we, we, we make sure that we, there's enough dollars in the supportive housing to, for people who are living in supportive housing to feel safe. Um, and, um, you know, we do try and make sure that people, uh, we put the right supports in place, that people, when they, in their own house, they do feel safe. And so it, it is about getting um, that right combination of supports. Obviously, as we heard, if people don't feel safe, then they, they do need to contact the police um, and follow up on that. Um, All right, thank you. Uh, do you think we have time for one more question? I received uh, three very similar questions, so I kind of wanted to get to that one. Um, we received a number of questions asking us about homeless camps, uh, little trailers, trailer homes, sheds, Dignity Villages, um, and they're wondering from the city's perspective if we've considered setting up a homeless camp someplace out of the view of the public, um, have we considered Dignity Villages or considered putting trailers in parking lots for people to live in? Can I just comment on that? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, I've, I've been probably through um, a number of, of camps now across the province, and I've also seen the Dignity Village in um, Portland, Oregon as well. And um, I, I think we've got to be really careful how we talk about tent cities. The populations that we see in our, in our camps and our tent cities is different than that happens in the States. So the one I saw in Oregon, um, the Dignity Village, it was um, low-income families and uh, people who are a bit down on the luck, kind of self-policing. Um, I have to say that's a very different population that we see in camps in BC. Um, we tend to see some of the um, most vulnerable and marginalized and people with significant challenges in our camps, and they are not safe. Um, I was involved um, from the beginning of the tent city in Victoria over the summer, and as I said in, in, in my comments at the start, um, it was started by people who were advocate, advocating around the lack of affordable housing, um, which is why we made that big announcement a couple of weeks ago about developing more affordable housing in, the, in this province. And it's why we hope the feds will jump back in and develop more affordable housing in partnership with us next year as well. Because one of the, ch the reasons we're in this challenge is because the feds jumped out of affordable housing in the 1990s. So uh, we want the first to jump back in in partnership with the province. But I, I just want to go back to the tent city. I, I think what happened there in the tent city in Victoria is that it started as a bit of a demonstration, but very quickly um, some of the most vulnerable ended up living there, and then they get preyed on by some not very nice people. So that then the, uh, the province steps in, goes for an injunction, and then it has to deal with, with uh, finding housing and shelter for people living in that tent city. And my concern about the tent cities that we see in this province, in these, um, across the municipalities in the Fraser Valley and elsewhere, is that um, they're really vulnerable, marginalized people who should be living in housing, not under canvas.
great, thank you. Um, so it is 9.03, and that is the time we had set aside for questions. Um, I do have some more here that people have emailed me, and I will do my best to respond to those questions directly by email and to, to have some of the individuals at the table here help us with a response. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, it's great that you were able to come out, and I'd like to thank everyone on the panel and the presenters for providing so much information. It was wonderful. Thank you. Um, as we conclude, please uh, feel free to visit the service providers at the back, and uh, thank you all for coming.